Morning all. Let's look at the great magician from Riga, Mikhail Tal, ten of his greatest sacrifices and combinations. Now by, by Tal's own admission, he indicates there are two types of sacrifices, correct ones and mine. So maybe he foresaw the engine uh, sort of perspectives we have now for very uh, scientifically proven sacrifices or not, if they're sound or not. But I think we should really try and appreciate the vast complexity of chess at a human level. Mikhail Tao was not playing against computers, he was playing against humans. Another very important quotation before I show you these sacrifices is that he has said, you must take your opponent into a deep dark forest where 2 plus 2 equals 5 and the path leading out is only wide enough for one. So yes, he, he created huge complexity. They might not be the soundest combinations and moves under the modern age of engine scrutiny, but he played against humans that tired, that were with tournament clocks under time pressure. Tao's reputation preceded him. The glare of Tao could put off and intimidate opponents, scare them to death, King's safety was a great concern to them. Maybe they, they used the excess energy. So with that in mind, let's begin this journey to look at 10 of his greatest. And to start off with, let's have a look at Mikhail Tao versus Vasily Spislov, who was another world chess champion from the USSR. This is in 1959, so a year before the candidates for the world championship match to play against Mikhail Botvinnik. Smyslov had just played bishop d8 here and it actually threatens to get quite a good position now. Uh, if, for example, bishop b3, I don't think this would be very good because black can now play c5 and from an engine point of view at least, black is actually doing very well here, for example like this, c4, and it gets quite murky. But Tao had something else in mind in this position after the bishop retreated to the eight. Mikhail Tal played queen h4. And you'll find many of these games, for example, uh, like this one, I've done detailed videos and I'll try and give the links in the description of the video. So we're just going to get the key moments. So queen h4 offers an enormously complex bishop sacrifice. This is actually taken and now queen g5, threatening queen takes g7 mate. Smyslov reacts resourcefully with knight h5, luring the queen potentially just to h5. That would be quite bad here, I think. Instead, a better move first. Knight h6 check. Now after king h8, it's here that Mikhail Tal plays queen takes h5. Slightly different with the knight on h6. We've got pressure on f7. We're offering this a2 though. What about Mikhail Tal's own king safety? This queen takes a2 is played. So there's no time for anything at the moment because this threat of mate, queen a1 mate. Mikhail Tal vacates d2 for his king and also now pins that g7 pawn. We see knight f6. And now a brilliant move. The next feature of this combinatory uh, game is queen takes f7. So the back row is slightly weak here. But you might think, isn't this ridiculous? Because actually the check would stop rook takes d8 here. Black is not compelled to play rook takes f7. Black does play queen a1 check. But after king d2, of course the rook is attacking the queen. White is actually much better now technically. Rook takes f7, knight takes f7 check after king g8. Rook takes a1, and here, after king takes f7, white is material up, and exchange up actually, two exchanges up, two minor pieces each, but, uh, sorry, one exchange up, pardon me. And the game didn't last long, knight e5 check, king e6, knight takes c6, winning a bit more material, knight e4 check was played, king e3. After bishop b6 check, bishop d4, actually, uh, Smyslov had had enough here. He is down significantly on material and resigned at this point. 
so that ju this this game kind of demonstrates you know whether there's a choice of being slightly worse or going for it sometimes it's good to go for it and he did with queen h4 let's have a look at another game now Mikhail Tao against Hans Joachim Hecht this was in the Varna Olympiad of 1962 a very very complex position indeed you'll notice that the black king is still in the center here the queen has been attacked and okay so queen drops back and now black is seemingly threatening things like b5 and knight takes h4 there's two threats to deal with here now ordinarily you know if if we play like bishop g3 this is not very good I think it's b5 and we can't even play knight d6 check because queen takes d6 and then we're going to win the white queen so bishop g3 doesn't seem as though it's that nice after b5 although white does have queen b3 but black again you know like our first example would be slightly better here black would be do doing very nicely he's covered now the d6 square Tal does not accept this he has great expectations from these positions ambitious expectations a fighter he plays actually e5 not caring about h4 or b5 here uh, so if knight takes h4 then actually knight d6 check the pawn is supporting knight d6 and then here it's it's actually better for white technically after rook a1 so it's not that cool to do this and this knight would have to go back for example if black wants to protect it and, and then actually there's a fork here virtual fork there's two two pieces being attacked so that's not so clear knight takes h4 black tries b5 and now we see queen sorry not queen b3 queen b3 is, is like um the engine recommendation here and that's actually okay for white but instead we see a wonderful idea e takes f6 sacrificing the queen uh, this is taken f takes g7 now the bishop is actually stopping black from castling queenside rook g8 now a beautiful move bishop f5 a drag and drop tactic if queen takes f5 knight d6 check if if queen takes c4 though uh, the king in the center is in trouble after rook a1 check the, the queen would have to give herself up but it'll be much better so here black has to play very carefully he played actually knight takes h4 which might be an inaccuracy now after bishop takes e6 bishop a6 was played knight d6 check king e7 white has emerged with a small advantage in this position after bishop c4 rook takes g7 g2 has to be defended g3 the knight is conveniently protecting the bishop so king takes d6 bishop takes a6 knight f5 and white is it is is a little bit better with the better pawn structure um, but uh, yeah technically black is two pawns up but it's a very very difficult position let's see what actually happened let's run through rook a b1 f6 guarding and directly the b7 square rook check it was a bit of a grind actually from this position so c4 g4 97 rook does invade via b7 this pawn starts dropping off now now it's again it's it's still slightly better for white knight d5 bishop takes c takes rook b4 black does have a lot of isolated pawns it is more difficult it would seem for black to pl play this position i think this is a slight mistake rook c8 black may have energetically tried f5 here but uh, after rook c8 this end game shows actually Mikhail Tal wasn't just about the middle game combinations his technique was superb and he's got these two connected pass pawns here on the king side which um, are going to be starting to move forward now they're moving forward check 
and this end game is actually now winning after rook g5 so quite a lot of play after the initial brilliant combination here in this game against hecht so very you know vastly complex positions but you can see if he didn't play the attacking move that he did like e5 he would uh, risk standing slightly worse and a more sort of clear position for the opponent so he needs to lead opponents to, to the forests as he says <laughs> uh, so where the complexity is high now let's look at Mikhail Tau against the great Dane Bent Larsen one of the strongest players uh, in, from the West like Fisher who played actually uh, in the USSR versus rest of the world match played above Fisher in that classic match here Mikhail Tau playing white has what seemingly uh, looks like a very promising attacking position he plays bishop d3 and it's nice aesthetically how the bishops are lined up against the king side here we see b4 now the thing is black does have quite an aggressive position if a move like knight e2 is played black actually can be slightly better potentially after bishop b7 say you can see black's you know fine here whites some way off an attack and you know there are issues uh, for white coming up there's pressure on e4 so actually after b4 we see actually a very surprising move instead uh, which the engines don't really like at a certain depth knight d5 but we're playing against humans so this is a kind of positional sacrifice it divides almost the opponent's position in two it makes it more difficult to defend e takes d5 e takes d5 and it liberates very importantly this bishop giving it lots of practical opportunities which the knight retreat wouldn't have this is a very important thing to bear in mind the complexity that your opponent has to face within the time limits it's very difficult to defend this position and in fact often you'll find uh, with you know engine checking these games that on now the engine thinks this is about equal just forcing it to look at this position with the opportunity of the bishops so it actually the engine literally starts changing its mind that it's only about equal now it's not uh, an unsound sack after all so i don't know maybe in the in the future we'll be in a better position to judge his sacrifices bent larson played f5 and this might be a mistake houdini is suggesting well actually g6 it's suggesting g6 might be a better move so f5 and you might have expected g takes for, for normal line opening operation g takes but actually Mikhail Tal just plays on that center line and keeps black black's pieces kind of hemmed in unable to use the f6 square rook f7 and then we see a build up of pressure bishop b7 and here this is actually technically um, not a very nice position already after the f5 it's getting actually worse by every move and after bishop takes f5 this is quite a horrible position for black now rook takes f5 rook takes e7 black tries knight e5 queen e4 attacking the rook that's protected and instead of moving the rook here uh, this is a very interesting feature of this if rook takes b7 for example then actually rook takes f4 and black has the advantage here uh, what what is actually uh, white white doing here for example queen e2 rook takes d4 if queen e3 uh, black can crash down to white's first rank and then play knight c4 so it could be a total disaster on rook takes b7 so the rook doesn't move instead we see f takes e5 keeping the pressure up and keeping the advantage actually technically Larson now tries rook f4 we see queen e3 rook f3 queen e2 it was going down a staircase queen takes e7 now queen takes f3 opposite color bishops but they sometimes favor the attacking player d takes e5 rook e1 is played pinning that pawn rook d8 rook takes e5 queen d6 
Now queen f4 threatens actually. Rook e8 check is a nasty threat against the queen. Rook f8. And in this position now queen e4. And white if makes if he makes time for b3 it's a very comfortable position with numerous threats after. Black tries b3. A takes check. King d2. So Tao's king is taking a little bit of walk of a walk here. Check c3. But now isn't it Tao's turn to go for Black's king? Bishop c5. Crushing. An absolutely crushing move. I think this is the top engine move actually in this position. Bishop c5. Queen takes the idea. Check. After rook f8, queen e6 check. And after king h8, the final crunching move. Can you guess it? Queen f7. And black cannot defend his first row here. Can't take time to win this because f8 is weak. Black had to resign here. So an enormously complicated uh, positional sacrifice in this game against Ben Larson. So after b4, you know, instead of accepting potentially a small disadvantage, could black could get a very en energized position, putting pressure on e4 here. This knight d5 created huge complexity for Ben Larson, who cracked under the pressure. And what was also interesting that the standard line opening principles weren't used instead just building up the pressure along the central file and keeping black's pieces hemmed in. Let's look at another game now. Another fantastic combination against Alexander Koblenz. So Mikhail Tal had an enormously complex position already here. He um attacking this G seven. Now black just defended with rook D seven. So it looks as though potentially uh there's a risk uh if given time, you know, knight g6 to trap Mikhail Tal's queen. Has he got too excited? Uh, so this is Mikhail Tal, 1957, three years before he became world champion. Um, has he gone overboard in this position? There's things like knight g6 and also g takes, just winning a piece. So he's got to do something very, very quickly here. Uh, I think it's the only move in the position. Bishop takes b5. So why is this the only move now? What what is happening here after Bishop takes b5? Well, there's a very interesting point. If the queen is if black tries to win the queen, white actually has knight d4, believe it or not. Counterattacking that e6 pawn and threatening um so knight takes e6 here is a threat. What what does black uh want to do in this position? If rook f7 protecting e6, then bishop takes, rook takes, and unbelievably, this next move does save white, uh, which is one of the subtle points of bishop takes b5, which maybe I, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure most of you wouldn't be aware of this because this is quite a staggering uh, resource here. That isn't the white queen being trapped. There's one move here which seems absolutely remarkable. I wonder if you can guess it. Okay, bishop d7. Unbelievable. It renews the threat of knight takes e6. Uh, to try and win Black's Queen. And if Queen takes d7, the incredible point is Knight takes e6. Now we're trying to deflect the Queen away from g7. And if, say, King f8, you know, Rook takes g7. So this is an incredible defensive resource against the Queen being trapped. This idea of Bishop d7 here. Uh, you know, if, if Bishop takes d7, then that's interfering with the queen's protection of protection of g7. So an incredible point about this. This is born out of necessity. This bishop takes b5 for this incredible resource uh, for knight d4 to work. Black tries rook f7. So still, if given another move, the queen's going to be trapped. 
We see now rook g1 taking away g6 now from that knight. Of course, putting more pressure on g7. Rook a7, black's trying to batten down that g7. Everything's now trying to protect g7. Knight d4 is played though. Again, leaving this bishop here as well. You know, if black dared take the bishop, knight, e either knight, but I think the stronger is knight d takes. And say the queen moves, rook g g7 crashes through. It's incredibly complex position, but um, white is crashing through here with knight takes uh, and knight b5. And now, and now it's really horrible for black. So let's go back after knight d4. Black tried actually knight g4, so he's abandoned that dream of winning the queen. F takes bishop e5, and now knight c6 is played. This technically might not be uh, the best here. Apparently, knight f3 is is quite good. So if bishop f6, we can carry on with g takes. But anyway, Mikhail Tal's move is is good enough to maintain an advantage though. Black played bishop takes c3, a slight inaccuracy perhaps. Apparently best is taking on b5, but this is such a complex position. So bishop takes c3, b takes c3 would be good, but Mikhail Tal played another very good move. Bishop e3, and white is actually threatening now bishop c5. It's not about winning the rook, it's about bishop c5 check to try and play for queen takes g8 once the king moves. d4 trying to stop that. And with this move, actually, the bishop uh, can't really help the h8 square for for one moment. You know, for for g6. And this next move is much more powerful because of that. Rook g h1 actually threatens now. Queen takes g8, and after king takes rook h8, mating. So black has to give a space for his king, or something. He has to do something about that. He plays rook d7. Bishop g5 is now played. And apparently this this isn't this isn't uh the absolute best move. White has a phenomenal position here, but I think it's even too complex for Mikhail Tal to get uh the perfect moves all the time. Apparently g5 in this position is is very very strong. And it it creates this idea of queen queen takes g6 uh queen takes g8 and g6 for example d takes queen takes king takes g6 so we're going to mate black again uh so that would be very strong if rook d1 we can just take with the king you know black's only having some spite checks here after bishop d3 e2 and that's that's the end of the checks virtually so but this move wasn't played so a slight, slight inaccuracy, and apparently uh, black is on the verge of almost equalising, even with the move played. A takes B5. So after all that, after all the brilliance so far with this bishop B5, we have still a very complex position. Rook 1 H6, the only move to keep white in the game, really. Vastly complex move. <laughs> Uh, black plays d3, and I think this is a, a fatal uh, mistake in this position to play d3. It looks quite tempting. If queen takes c6, let's examine the craziness of this. Rook f6 check, g takes, check, rook g7, bishop takes. And apparently black could have potentially theoretically escaped like this. It's crazy, but it seems as though theoretically, if Mikhail Tal had been playing a supercomputer, funny enough, he might not have had an advantage here. Apparently it's it's equal after rook takes a7. And we get this uh, continuation. And it can lead to equality. But no, his human opponent played d3 here. And now... Tau took on c3, 
d2 check king d1 queen takes c6 and now rook f6 is much stronger than before here rook f6 check so what's the idea well in the game rook f7 was played if g takes f6 bishop h6 is strong after rook g7 bishop takes and white is actually doing much better than the variation we just saw because here white can just you know take the rook here and be much better there's no amazing checks here for black white is actually much better there so in this position after rook f6 black tried rook f7 and now a really crushing move queen takes g7 and black resigns here black is actually faced with a forced mate the quicker mate continuation is like this mate in three coming up uh, the long one is a mate in eight actually uh, or nine sorry mate in nine with king e8 rook takes f7 <laughs> check queen g2 king c1 check you might wonder what what is this about well if if rook takes h1 uh, then there's rook takes f7 but so technically I'm just running through the, the technically best moves just to escape the checks and after this uh, you know it's in spike check territory we, we're just in spike check territory you know blacks blacks getting mated basically let's, let's not bother with that so rook f6 uh, rook f7 taking this this was the game con um, not the game continuation black resigned uh, here I think Queen takes g7 on move 37 these are mind-boggling combinations to be honest mind-boggling uh, so let's have a look at Mikhail Botvinnik against Mikhail Tal from the 1960 World Championship match so Mikhail Tal played in this game a King's Engine defense we arrived at this position with Rook a1 and now a brilliant move which gives practical chances that unleashes a bishop black played knight f4 to try and position it unleash the bishop it was taken e takes f4 it creates opportunities it's a peace sacrifice it also gives black access to that e5 square and another useful diagonal here bishop d2 Mikhail Botman plays bishop d2 queen takes b2 and technically okay white from an engine perspective might be a bit better here but uh, it's a very very complex position now so f3 attacking white's queen white can easily go wrong here and get tired he plays rook takes b2 in this position already this might be a mistake here it seems bishop takes f3 was the way to go bishop takes b1 rook takes b1 queen c2 and white could end up being significantly better but Mikhail Botvinnik maybe after f3 he blundered he blundered he played rook takes b2 blacks in the driving seat now f takes e2 black's now threatening bishop takes c3 of course rook b3 defending that rook d4 bishop e1 now that e5 square is used bishop e5 check bishop f4 black is actually much better now knight takes e2 rook takes c1 and i'll show you the rest of the game check bishop e4 the end game is better for black and this is what happened black's got that dangerous bishop here in these nasty pins king comes up the center pawn starts walking down some exchanges and this this pass pawn is actually a winner here for Mikhail Tal in the ending after rook d7 check actually Mikhail Botvinnik apparently resigned I think with this move realizing it was hopeless after say king e3 
this this pawn is is just winning. Say check, check. The the, the pawn is going to be uh, coming down too quickly. That's going to uh, be quitting that or winning the rook. So that was from the 1960 World Championship match against Mikhail Botvinnik. Now another Smyslov classic from the USSR Team Championship next. In 1964, uh, Mikhail Tal just played bishop takes f3, and we see rook e1, and and the knight is protecting e1. I mean, everything's you know quite a lot of things are protecting e1. So is the queen just going to move? It's not going to take, surely. Well, it doesn't take, but the queen actually does something very interesting to celebrate. Might slightly weaken the light square. The queen actually goes into e2. Let's say if if Mikhail Tower had chosen something else, say Queen D7. Actually, on on this occasion, actually this this is this is actually quite nice for Black just to sacrifice the G6 pawn here. Uh, after Bishop B7, there, there are there are some serious threats like Queen C6. So this is actually potentially quite nice for Black, but this this is a more spectacular continuation. Queen E2, <coughs> which was played. Smyslov took this, and you know maybe you know he Mikhail Tal sort of banked on Smyslov trying to get a, a simplified, clear, crystal clear kind of end game with a small advantage, because that's Smyslov's style. And you know there are some sacrifices Smyslov, uh, sorry Tal would play against certain people that he wouldn't against others. And here, I think he kind of banked that Smyslov would do this instead of playing Queen C1, which might allow a more complicated position. After check, Knight takes F5. It's a complicated position. Black has you know threats building up like Rook E8 into double the rooks. Smyslov tried to kill all the fun in the position. Killjoy. <laughs> he played Queen takes E2, but nevertheless, Black is actually doing slightly better. In this end game now, a tiny bit better. Uh, so White had to try and protect d3 there. So rook e1, bishop h5, and the game went on actually for quite some some while. Uh, but um, the interesting thing here about this game, the bishop actually made gradual inroads, and White actually played a, a, a kind of fatal mistake actually, which didn't really improve his position. I think. Um, a4 later is, is like a target for the bishop. Actually, not such a fatal mistake, but uh, it's another target to fix for, for the light square bishop. And Mikhail Tal made inroads in this end game. Gradually, gradual inroads. Uh, so it's trying to provoke another pawn move here, which gives him the g4 square. Pawn actually didn't move. Instead, we see this, but uh, now the Black King can get into that g4 square, and Black is now winning this endgame. So created that past a pawn now after winning White a pawn, and the grind is really in progress. And the past f pawn now, even though the a pawn is being lost, the past f pawn decided the game. The two past pawns overwhelm the Knight here. Uh, White resigned this position. <clears throat> move seventy-two. If check, you know, we take this. Obviously, King e3. Well, not obviously, but uh, this this is actually a winning King and pawn ending now. Now, now it's more obvious. I think we can say that it's a winning King and pawn ending. So it was a beautiful move. Rook. Um, the aesthetics of of playing <coughs> Queen e2, but I think it also demonstrated this probability that was going on. In Mikhail Tal's mind, that he knew the style of Smyslov. You know, he, he's in favour of clear play. Doesn't like defending. Doesn't like the thought of the opponent building up. You know, say rooks on the seventh. So if, I think he presumed that Smyslov would just play this move. Queen takes e2 here instead of instead of trying to play queen c1. Okay, let's go on to another classic. So Mikhail Tal against Fischer. Now Fischer wasn't at his peak. 1959, uh, the Belgrade K 
candidates that was actually bled Zagreb, Belgrade, three different places for this candidate. Fisher playing black, played queen f6 here. And it looks as though the knight attacked and, and should move here. If knight e2, then actually this is going to be fine almost, almost for, black, for Fisher. Knight e5, it's, it's not, uh, not the end of the world yet for, for black's position. Uh, so black might have some some process from an engine point of view. It's it's only a small advantage to white, but uh, Mikhail Tau is having none of that. As our, as our previous examples show, you know, there's this choice between being slightly disadvantaged or playing something quite interesting. He plays something quite interesting. Rook e6, and actually, from an engine point of view, this is this is actually quite a liked move. Actually, this is one of the more sounder uh, sacrifices, I think. White is al already in, you know, a very very good position, and Fisher, you know, he's got this knight to take here. Apparently, it's best to avoid taking knight with queen g7. So after takes, it it looks a little bit unpleasant for Black. Um, it is it is a uh, significant advantage for White here, but they're still playing the position. It's it's not over yet. But uh, Fisher actually played in reaction to this. He played actually queen takes c3. So the queen's been lured away you know, from defending the king, and actually bishop takes f5 check is quite powerful here. If king h8 then check here crashes through like this, the bishop's very useful actually on on f5, supporting that h7. Um, and if king g7, well, there's still it's. Sorry, that's still that's still mating. Uh, yeah, that's pretty pretty much mating if knight takes check and we're mating on, on h7. Uh, so this this is a very difficult position. Fisher actually has to play rook takes f5, but white is in a very strong position here. He actually now white plays an incredible move, which. Creates a massive advantage here. Just rook f3. There's no actual useful checks. The knight is stopping c1 and a1 checks. The rook here is stopping the e1 check. And white is, you know, got a very very dangerous position. Queen b2. And now rook e8. The rook's very useful for rook g3 here. And there's a nasty pin on c8. Fisher tries knight d f6, which leaves that nasty pin really. Uh, there's not much better that black can do though. Queen takes f6, queen takes, rook takes f6, king g7, and now rook f f8. Nasty pin on that c8 bishop indeed. Knight a5, black is kind of helpless here. H4, being coming into some sort of Zogswang almost knight c4. Now here, I mean, what does what does Black actually uh, do? Okay, his rook's holding down. Rook takes e7. Black tried b5, but this gives up the e, the c6 uh, square, weakens the c6 square, and also it means rook f7 is now supported to win that knight. So black is losing more material here and resigned. So the critical moment here, this decision, you know, accept a small advantage or be brave. That's that seems to be a recurring question in Mikhail Tal's games. Be brave, but it's actually the, a very good position for rookie six in any case. It's an advantage to white this position. Just 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 to show you though, the power of rook f3 uh here, if you know, if this this give black a different move. Queen Queen G seven. We see that Rook G three. It's just the rooks are coordinating. The knight is actually controlling A one. So that's why this this was uh, necessary for Fisher's knight D F six. This Rook F three was actually a very very powerful idea. Let's go to Chicago, a place where I've been actually once on business. Uh, it. <laughs> in finance. Uh, so Mikhail Tal against Robert Forbis in Chicago 1988. So much later Mikhail Tal. 
nearly 30 years after he, he was world champion. But it's a beautiful little one, probably a lesser known one, lesser known player, Richard Forbes, but Tao still had it going on. After E5, which was played by Black, Mikhail Tao left his rook hanging. It might not be technically the strongest move, but here there's a choice between playing a slightly duller position with rook d3 and a, a small advantage for white or going for black's uh, king if the queens come off as many of us um, enthusiasts of the game know it's often less exciting and Tal realized that as well he kept the queens on queen h6 he's going for the throat here instead he's passed up a, a small theoretical advantage there to do this but now you know there's rope for, for black to hang himself he takes the queen, uh, takes the rook with his queen. That's fine so far. Check king g8. And now another ambitious move here, uh, which in theory might only be uh, equal. Uh, technically, white is doing okay with check and h6 here. E4, and that's the that's the snag. The queen is protecting g7. Rook d1. Rook g8, and technically white is again a little bit better with queen takes g8 here and rook takes d4. It's another way of exchanging off queens, but no, Tao is trying to distract the queen away from g7, uh, the queen away from protecting g7. Uh, he plays knight d5, trying to get the queen onto a light square. So if queen takes d5, then actually check and h6. It's pretty nasty. It's it's mating black unless black wants to give up the queen. Uh, so after knight d5, this is very tricky. Black blundered here. Uh, there's two moves to stay in rook f c8 apparently or h6. Uh, so technically, this position uh, might actually be okay for black, but instead we see rook f e8. And you might think, well, why is that so terrible? Well, check and now h6. So we see e4 here, the queen protecting g7. But now f6, rook g8. And now queen g7 finishes black off after takes hg, king g8, knight e7 is mate. So why after rook f e h you wonder how did this happen that uh, that continuation isn't possible here after rook f c eight. Let's just run through that. On on here king h eight f six there's rook g eight immediately Actually, I think this is too complex to try and demonstrate. E4. Now, if F6 here, ah, no, no, it's not too complex to demonstrate. Pardon me. The point is that the rook on C8 affords rook takes C2 check as a counterattack in this position, and actually, Black has turned the tables here. So that's why White would be forced into a continuation, which. Um, so white can't allow this stuff because now rook g8. So that's how rook c8 is actually a very important defensive move in a way, going for the attack rather than rook e8. So in the game, rook e8 doesn't have any implications at all. It doesn't have the faintest implications at all uh, for white's king. And so there's no such counter resources available here for any rook c2s. So sometimes, yeah, you've got to give yourself some hope and opportunity with your pieces if if you're on, on the receiving end of a tal attack. Try and have some faint uh, fret in the background, otherwise you'll get mated. Now, the next example, fantastic, brilliance from Mikhail Tal. Mikhail Tal was actually playing with the black pieces. Let's flip and played what is, I think this came from a modern Bononi, which is looked down on nowadays. 
because uh, of this d6 pawn. The modern Benoni, son of sorrow, Benoni. D6 pawn in particular is a structural liability. But um, okay, uh, pardon me. Knight g4 was played, and it looks as though the knights might be just aiming for for an attack on f2. So White tried to repulse the knights with h3, as though the knights going back. But actually, Mikhail Tells played a much better move than knight e5. If knight e5, you know, f4, and White has small advantage actually. So this next move is is actually very very good technically and everything ticks every box knight takes f2 okay white does best not to take it actually to play knight f3 but still black would be better black can actually take on c3 here then take on e4 and black would be better in this position even though he's, he's compromised a bit his own king this is the way to play it technically but uh, no, white actually took the bait. King takes f2. And now we see absolute brilliance. Check. Bishop d4 threatening queen f2 mate. Knight d1. And now a real shocker here. Shocking feature in this position. Can you guess if I give you 10 seconds? Okay, queen takes h3. So if g takes, there's Bishop takes h3 is, is mate. Uh, so so black is actually doing really well here, as you might expect. Bishop f3, queen h2. The threats continue. In, even knight takes d5 just to cut the king from e2 to open up that rook is now on the cards. Knight e3, defending d5. But now f5, knight dc4. And there's also this diagonal to be concerned about. f takes, bishop takes. Bishop a6 pinning the knight and the threat now includes just taking here and then bringing the other rook in. Bishop f3, rook e5 and now knight takes d5 is actually on the cards or just building up the pressure. Rook a3, black builds up the pressure actually now with rook a e8, bishop d2. Knight takes d5 is played now, and this is crushing. Bishop takes d5 check, rook takes d5. The point is here, if knight takes d5, we've always got this uh, queen h1 or queen g1 mating. We can't do that. The rook is stopping the king walking across. So king uh, e2 was played, trying to walk across anyway now. Bishop takes e3. Rook takes e3, bishop takes c4 check, and here white resigned. If he plays queen takes c4, then actually queen takes g2 is absolutely crushing with mate next move after king d1, queen takes d2. So it was a really fantastic dynamic display from a Benoni position where black has that e5 square and some trump cards like e5 pressure. They're all demonstrated here quite vividly how black can have a really dangerous attack whipped up after knight takes f2. Now the last example, the tenth I'd like to show you, is Mikhail Tao against Jizar Fuster. This is two years before he became world champion, 1958. Mikhail Tao playing with the white pieces. In this position, it seems a very, very nice position. Uh, white now played h4. Now if black castled routinely here, then knight takes f7. Because the idea, you know, queen takes, we've got bishop takes e6, winning the queen. So black tried to first evict the knight with f6. So Tao's got this choice. Does he accept potentially a small disadvantage or a concession? If he plays knight f3, actually he will have a disadvantage. Black could castle queenside and flee. It doesn't really matter about taking the pawn. Black actually technically stands better here. So I think this is a, a lesson really that um, do it or die principle. Do it or die.
Mikhail Tal keeps the Black King in the centre. Bishop takes e6, the peace sack. The engines validate it, this is sound. F takes, D takes e5. This is the way to play, stopping the king castling either side. Bishop e7. Bishop d7 uh, check is lucrative here actually, but uh, it wasn't played for a moment. Rook f1. Now, threat of bishop f7 or queen c4, for example. Rook f8 at least stops bishop f7. But now, rook takes f8. Bishop takes queen f3. What is the threat, you wonder, after queen f3? Well, there is actually things uh, that include uh, rook d7 or bishop d7 now. Because the queen is cutting the king from using that seventh rank. Queen e7 is played. And now queen b3. And white is still cutting the king from f7 on the diagonal here. So bishop d7 is looking strong as a threat. Rook b8. Check with that queen cutting f7. Does the king really want to do this? King's had it here actually. If King D eight, which wasn't played, then check actually is is pretty nasty because uh, now we can actually take this bishop and the attack carries on. So Black actually decided to sacrifice the queen. Rook takes, King takes, check. Bishop E seven, check. And after Queen takes G seven, actually Black resigned, even though in theory he's almost got enough material for the Queen. Uh, but this is a horrendous position actually. It's dislocated. Say so Bishop E four, Queen E five hits and wins wins material here. But what, what else does Black do in this position to save the Bishop? So he is actually losing material here. So that's why I think he must have resigned. He saw that he was losing material. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this <laughs> very, very complex tour. Uh, you did ask for it of uh, after after we looked at some Fisher brilliancies uh, yesterday. So, ten of Mikhail Tal's most celebrated combinations. A bit mind blowing, to be honest. Comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.